This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I want to ask you something. You know, every now and then I've told you about the good old American custom of serving a glass of sherry before dinner. Particularly Petri California sherry. And I wonder if you've tried that Petri sherry. Really, a glass of Petri sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. Petri sherry is clear, fragrant, and truly delicious. It's a wonderful wine whose flavor is the essence of luscious, sun-ripened grapes. And Petri makes two kinds of sherry wine, a regular sherry and Petri Pale Dry. If you don't know which you prefer, try them both. Don't buy one, buy two. But remember, always buy Petri, because Petri wine is always good wine. Well, I'm sure Dr. Watson's ready for us. Let's go in and join him, shall we? Come in, come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. Quiet, with it. Quiet, Monty. Lie down. The dogs seem very pleased with themselves tonight. Did they have a good day? Yes, the three of us did, my boy. Uh, go on, run off, run off out in the patio. I took a seven iron and some old golf balls on the beach this afternoon. I improved my game, I think, and the dogs had a great time chasing the golf balls. On the way home, the little rascals had a Curious battle with an elderly pelican. <laughs> so their day was complete. I'll have to join you on one of your afternoon strolls, Doctor. You and the dog seem to have so much fun. Oh, I'll be glad of your company, Mr. Bartell. Well, draw up your usual chair, and I'll get on with tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure. From the hints you gave us last week, I guess a Frenchman played a prominent part in the story? Yes, indeed he did, Mr. Bartell. His name was Francois Lavia. And he was a detective of some note in his own country. The time my story begins, it was in 1889, to be exact. Lavia had come over to London to discuss with Holmes the difficulties of translating some of his monographs into the French language. At this particular time, I was in the early days of my marriage, Mr. Bartell, and this fact, combined with a busy practice, meant that I saw very little of my old friend. He must have missed you, Doctor. Oh, well, he did. Oh, well, of course, he'd never admit the fact, but, uh, but uh, to get on with my story... One cloudless June afternoon, I found myself in the neighborhood of Baker Street, and I couldn't resist paying a visit to Holmes. Mrs. Hudson was out, but uh, having retained my old latch key, I let myself in and mounted the familiar stairs. It gave me a strange feeling as I raised my hand to knock on what once had been my own living room door. Come in, come in. Oh, hello, Holmes. Hello, Holmes. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I didn't know you were... Watson, my dear fellow. How very nice to see you again. <laughs> it's great to see you, Holmes. I, I'm i sorry I interrupted you. I, no. I didn't know that you had company. Not at all, my dear fellow. We're delighted, aren't we, Le Villard? Hello, Watson, oui. this is uh, Monsieur Le Villard. Well, uh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Enchanté, monsieur. I have often wished to meet the so charming Dr. Watson. Holmes has told me a great deal about you. Oh, it's very nice of you, sir. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> that suits you, Watson. You look splendid, old fellow. Gained a little weight, haven't you? Oh, uh, yes, a few pounds, I mean. Here comes you. Sit down, won't you? Uh, you sure that I'm not interrupting you in some important discussion? Oh, no, 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 mon cher docteur. We were having a good-natured argument on the relative abilities of the French criminal compared to the English. Oh, interesting. <laughs> you must lend me your support, idea. Watson. Monsieur Le Villa is convinced that the English criminal is a very dull dog indeed. Well, we've met some far from dull ones in our time, I... I assure you, Monsieur Levia. Ah, the exceptions <laughs> rather than the rule, I fear, mon cher doctor. <laughs> You're stubborn, aren't you, Levia? <laughs> Believe me, my dear friend, that I will yield to no one in my admiration of your knowledge and skill. That is why I wish I could persuade you to practice in Paris. Ah, there you would find opponents really worthy of your steel. What can happen to interest you in this land of grey frogs, uh, boiled potatoes, and uh, pots of tea? Gracious me, for myself, sir, you you're not very flattering. Oh, don't be so insular, Watson. Oh, I meant no offense, my friend. Well, you say that the English criminal is dull. Well, mm. perhaps if you were to read a published story of mine called a, a Study in Scarlet, you'd think differently. It tells of a very exciting adventure that Holmes and I had. 
I have read it, my friend. Oh, you have? An extremely gripping story, oh, but yes. surely you will admit that the crime was essentially of American origin. <laughs> He's right, Watson. <laughs> He's perfectly right, dear me. What can I do to vindicate the dishonor of the London criminal? Let me see. Oh, yes, yes, of course. A copy of today's Times. That's fine. I shall introduce you to a section known as the Agony Column. Uh, where is it now? Oh, yes, here we are. This should convince you of the color and variety of English life. The agony column? Mm -hmm. It sounds most painful. Uh, what is it, Brian? A personal column is liable to contain anything from a lover's frantic appeal to his lady love to a ransom note. In my profession, I've frequently found it an invaluable medium for contacting the underworld. Uh-huh. Yes, now, here we are. Here's something. Uh, dear me. Oh, dear, no. Today's column seems rather uninspired, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, may I examine it? Of course, here you are. Merci. Um, if the lady who helped my little boy across the road at the corner of Threadwell Street and High Auburn last Wednesday at four uh, will get in touch with Box 845, she will learn of something to her advantage. <laughs> we can be more colorful than that in Paris, my friend. Yes, I think we can do better than that, too. Yeah, look at this, will you? Oh, the printer must have been half asleep when he mm. set up to type for this advertisement. Will any gentleman interested in discussing... Cryptography and cipher writing. Please communicate with Box XQL 696, the time. Well, oh, I, I fail to find this message any more stirring than the preceding one. You notice the execrable printing, don't you? Indeed I do. It is all mixed up. Uh, the first word, will, uh, starts with a capital W and a capital I. Uh, the second word, any, starts with a small A and then has a capital N and Y. It is a shocking example of typography. And when it occurs in a paper noted for its excellence in typesetting, one realizes that uh, this is no mistake. What do you mean, huh? This is undoubtedly a code message. Oh, 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 come now, my friend. I defy even you to make a mystery out of a printer's negligence. I accept your challenge, my dear Leviar. If you recall, the Baconian bilateral cipher depends upon the use of two sizes of type. If we group the letters in units of five, the arrangements of small and capital letters within the group should give us the message. Now, let's see. Two capitals followed by three small gives us the letter H. Then two capitals, one small, two more. Ca that gives us E, H. I still think you are trying to make an adventure out of a mere printing accident. Oh, no. no mere printing accident could so readily fall into one of the great traditional ciphers. Now, let's see. This message reads H, E, L, help, uh... Uh, Q, too small. A Q, I, uh, quilter. Help, quilter. Um, L, L, too small and large. L, elms. Help, quilter. Elms, pe there it is, yes. Penge. Help, quilter. Elms, penge. Help, quilter. Elms, penge. Well, what does that mean? Presumably that a man named Quilter, who lives at a house called the Elms, in the village of Penge, needs help. Ah, I see it now. A helpless victim held prisoner. He smuggles out this message as a, as a harmless personnel uh, with strict instructions that it be printed on this art form. He knows that the amateurs of cryptography to whom it is addressed will decipher this call for help. Et voilà. Monsieur Via, you seem ready to grant that adventure can exist in London after all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the advantage, my dear Watson, of a more mercurial temperament than we Englishmen possess. Well, Le Villard, what about it? Mm. Shall we set off for Penge and rescue the ingeni ingenious Mr. Quilter from whatever dire fate awaits him in the elms? I'm all in patience. Mm. Splendid. Watson, I suppose you're too busy to join us. Uh, too busy? Well, I mean, your practice, I'm sure that you've got patience to Oh, yes, 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 of course, yes. As a matter of fact, I have two further visits to make today. One to a peppery old miser who has gout, and the other to a wealthy society woman who has a cute attack of hypochondria, hypochondria, as they call it. The two places with them to help both from my... I'm coming with you, Holmes, if you want me. Bravo, Watson, and grab your hat and coat. The game's afoot. Here you are, gents, the helm's pinned. Nice afternoon for a drive, wasn't it? Afraid it'll cost you 15 bob, though. There's a sovereign for you. You can keep the change. Oh, me, thank you, Governor. Top of the evening to you, gents. Oh, uh, so, uh, this is the Elms, eh? Quite a bit of land for such a modest neighborhood. <laughs> to call it the Elms seems remarkably inappropriate. 
I, I cannot see an elm tree in sight. So you see, Livia, the English have more imagination than you give them credit for. Are you just going to walk up to the front door and knock, Holmes? Why not? The direct approach is often the most satisfactory. Oh, you disappoint me. I had hoped that perhaps you would adopt one of the disguises in which you are so adept, I am told. Well, since it's unlikely that these people know me by sight, that's hardly necessary, is it? However, I trust that this little problem may reward you with some colorful highlights before we throw... Oh. It's Scott. Revolver shots. They came from the house. Ah, we are too late. Mr. Quilter has been murdered. No, I think not. You will observe that the next-door neighbor to the Elms was mowing his front lawn as we drove up. He is still engaged in the same occupation. Obviously, revolver shots attract little attention this my sentence. Mon Dieu, you mean that violence and sudden death are so common that they do not attract even the passing <laughs> interest? <laughs> no, we are. <laughs> even the British are not as phlegmatic as that. Then what is the answer to those shots, Holmes? Look, some member of this household is addicted to pistol practice. The fact that a shooting target is nailed to the back of that fence over there would further support the theory. Well, that's rather ominous, in my opinion. Well, give me out the front door. Let's keep our wits about us, anyway. Are you carrying a revolver, Dr. Watson? No, only a stethoscope, I'm afraid. I was prepared for sickness when I left the house today, and not for crime. Mm, I, too, am unarmed. How about you, Monsieur Holmes? Only a mag magnifying glass, I'm afraid. Hardly a very lethal weapon. Yes? My friends and I were calling on Mr. Coulter. Oh? Who are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes, and these are my friends. Dr. Watson and Monsieur Le Viard. How do you do, 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 madam? How do you do? Is Mr. Quilter expect? I don't know. We uh, read his advertisement in the agony column of the Times today and came down here at once. Are you uh, a relation of his? I'm his niece. Oh. My name is Doris Favisham. Come in, won't you? Uh, Miss Favisham, I suppose it is. Yes, doctor. It's Miss Favisham. Uh, we uh, heard three revolver shots as we were walking up the driveway. They... It gave us quite a start. Yes, mademoiselle. We were afraid that we might have arrived at the time of tragedy. Yes, indeed. Tragedy? Oh, 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 oh. my hobby is revolver shooting. I was doing some target practice in the back garden as you arrived. Revolver <laughs> shooting, Miss Favish. Oh, very interesting. I flatter myself that I'm something of a marksman myself. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps we can have a match. Won't you sit down? Your challenge intrigues me, Miss Favisham, but uh, before I accept it, I should like to see Mr. Quilter. Well, Uncle George is paralyzed, you know. Oh, Spends all his time in a wheelchair. I'm not at all sure he'll see you. Well, at least you can ask him, can't you, Miss Favisham? It is his custom at this time of the day to take a little nap. Uh, perhaps tomorrow... Doris! Doris! Oh, he's still awake. Who's here? Yes, Virginia? Uncle. Some men have come to see you, Uncle. Well, bring him in. Bring him in. Follow me, gentlemen. Uncle? This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, and Monsieur... Uh, Monsieur... Le Villard. And Monsieur Le Villard. Uh, how do you do, sir? How do you do, sir? Uh, how do you do? Sherlock Holmes, eh? It took you long enough to decipher my message and get here, didn't it? Your brother's a much faster worker, isn't he? Oh, what makes you say that, Mr. Quilter? Received this telegram from him at 11 o'clock this morning. Read it for yourself. Oh, <laughs> well, what did you say, Holmes? Huh? Suggest you consult my brother Sherlock, and it's... It's signed by Croft Holmes. Yes, Mr. Quilton. My, my brother is a much faster worker. Or shall we say that he suffers from the unfortunate habit of early rising? He undoubtedly read the agony column three hours before I did today. Oh, don't know about that. But I've been expecting you all day. I imagine you know why I inserted that advertisement. Well, I had the impression that uh, you were under some form of restraint. That uh, you were in need of a rescue party, as it were. Rubbish. Hmm? My advertisement was a piece of subtle bait. The only person that could decipher the message would obviously be someone who knew the Baconian cipher. Very logical deduction, Mr. Quilter. You see, I'm convinced, as any sensible man should be, that the so-called Shakespearean plays were written by Sir Francis Bacon. Oh, I see. But I felt that it needed a clever man to prove the fact. Mm -hmm. I was sure that anyone who was able to decipher my message was the man I needed. And what will it take, Mr. Holmes, to do the job? I'm a rich man. Name your fee. Do you mean to say that you inveigled Mr. Holmes down here just to do some research? On the origin of Shakespeare's work? Oh, you needn't look so shocked, Dr. Watson. Oh, uh, My uncle has offered to pay him a handsome fee. Well, what do you say, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? It's an interesting subject for research. I'll concede that Ignatius Donnelly and others have proved almost beyond doubt that William Shakespeare of Stratford on Avon did not write the plays, but I greatly doubt that Lord Bacon did. I may devote my leisure and later years to some investigation on the subject, but in the meanwhile, Mr. Quilter, I'm afraid I'm much too busy to undertake such an assignment. Oh, please yourself. Show the gentleman out, Doris. Goodbye, sir. Oh, good day, sir. Too bad.
bed. You had this long drive down here for nothing, gentlemen. Yes, I'm afraid I quite agree on it. It would seem to me I'm... that your uncle has a distinct talent for practical joking, mademoiselle. Uncle? Oh, uncle never made a joke in his life. Uh, Mr. Holmes, now that you're here, perhaps you'd like to indulge in a little shooting match. Thank you, Miss Faversham, but um, as I told your uncle, I'm a busy man. Good evening to you. Goodbye, gentlemen. Uh, Goodbye. Goodbye. Holmes, old fellow, you're, you're losing your touch. You'd never made a blunder like this if I'd still been with you. <laughs> it is comforting for an aspiring detective like myself to know that the great Sherlock Holmes is fallible. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> then am I to assume that I must continue the case alone? What do you mean, continue the case? There isn't, uh, there isn't one. Quilt is in no danger. He's in desperate danger. What? I'm only afraid I may be too late to save him. But we have just spoken to the man. Oh, no. Did neither of you notice the traces of fresh loam on the boots of that supposedly paralyzed man? Gentlemen, I fear the agony column has led us to murder. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. Time enough for me to mention that any meal is a better meal when it's served with a Petri dinner wine. If you're having chicken or fish... Use Petri California Sautern. Petri Sautern is a subtle, delicately flavored white wine that looks and tastes like captured sunshine. If you're having a roast or chops or any kind of meat or meat dish, then by all means, serve Petri California Burgundy. Petri Burgundy is a hearty, full-flavored red wine. One of the most delicious red wines you ever poured from a bottle. Why not get a bottle of each? Petri Burgundy and Petri Sautern. Then, no matter what you have for dinner, you'll surely have the right wine, a Petri wine. Well, Doctor, why did you have to break off your story there? Well, I had to break it off somewhere, Mr. Bartell, and that seemed to be the most exciting spot. It certainly was. I was convinced that the great Sherlock Holmes had been fooled for once. What happened next? Well, I I need this to remark we did not get into a cab and go back to London, but let me pick up the story at the same place that I broke it off. As Holmes said... Gentlemen, I fear the agony column has led us to murder. Murder? There was fresh earth on the soles of his boots, you say? Distinct traces. Proving that the man in the wheelchair was not paralyzed. And that man, whoever he is, was impersonating Quilter to put us off the track. And the real Quilter may have been killed, eh? I'm afraid so. Let's stop here for a moment, shall we, while we make our plans. This hedge will hide us from the house in case they're watching from the windows. Now, this isn't a hard picture to reconstruct. There undoubtedly is or was a paralyzed Baconian scholar named Quilter. He managed to smuggle out that ingenious plea for help, but Mycroft's unfortunate telegram gave the game away. Mm-hmm. I see it now. The people in there holding him prisoner forced him to reveal what he has done, eh? What they may have done to him, heaven alone knows. One of the criminals, guessing from the telegram that I might appear on the case, posed as the crippled Quilter. What's our next move, Holmes? Remember that singularly unattractive young lady skilled with a revolver? We must search the grounds as unobtrusively as we can. Search the grounds? For what? Uh, I can answer that question, Monsieur Doctor. We search for signs of the freshly turned earth of a grave. Well, we didn't find any traces of the poor devil's corpse, thank heaven. No. A great disappointment. Oh, Jeremy, you're very bloodthirsty in the VR. Hello. Look at the old fellow trimming the hedge over there. Must be the gardener. Let's have a chat with him, shall we? may be able to give us some information. Good evening to you. Good evening to you, gentlemen. Really? You work for Mr. Quilter? That I do, sir. That I do. Ah, very fine work, too. I've seldom seen a better kept garden. Oh, thank you, sir. I do pride myself in my work. I wonder if you can help me. I'd be glad to if I can, sir. Uh, did you see a telegraph boy deliver a message here this morning? That I did, sir. The boy came here about 10 o'clock this morning. I was a clip in the front edge at the time. And uh, you've been working here ever since? Yes, sir. Brought my lunch with me today and ate it in the garden. Has anyone entered or left the house since that telegram was delivered? No, sir. No one except yourselves. I see, I see. I suppose you occasionally run errands for Mr. Quilter? Not much these days, sir. The poor old gentleman keeps his chair in the house pretty much all the time, sir. I did run a message for him yesterday, oh, though. Oh, you did? Hmm? Where to? Well, sir, I was pruning the rose bushes under his study windows when the window opens and his hand comes out with a message. He told me to take it to the village office of the Times and to tell him to print it just the way it was. He looked kind of worried when he gave me the message. And he 
He whispered to me, just as if he was afraid in his own house. I'm much obliged to you. Here's five shillings for your trouble. Oh, thank you, sir. Much obliged <laughs> to you, I'm sure. Good evening. Good evening to you, gentlemen. Well, so that's how the message was smuggled out. Mm, and no one has come to the house or left it since that telegram was delivered. Therefore, Coulter or his body must still be inside that house. We are going to search the house? Yes, we are. But we're not armed, and they certainly are. They probably won't even let us in. Yes, they will. We have a, an infallible key to entry, a woman's vanity. Come on. <laughs> So you came back. I thought you wouldn't be able to resist my challenge to a pistol match, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> exactly, Miss Lavisham. We had difficulty in finding a cab and decided to take a train back to London. It was an hour's wait, so I... Well, I thought I'd accept your challenge. Good. Come in. We'll go into the back garden. Thank you. Don't talk loudly. I think Uncle's asleep in the next room. Don't bring anybody in here, Doris. I want to see. All right, Uncle. This way, gentlemen. If your uncle wants to sleep, he was a funny sort of al- alibi. <laughs> oh, well, he's used to that, Doctor. Here we are. This is the 50 yard range, Mr. Mm-hmm. Holmes. Three shots, best aggregate score wins. How much do you want to bet? Uh, you name the stake. <coughs> name the stakes, Miss Favisham. A sovereign? Certainly. You uh, take the first three shots? Very well. I must just check that it's loaded. Yes, six bullets. All right, here I go. Bravo, Miss Faversham. Splendid. Who's I? And two winners. I can do better. Your turn, Mr. Holmes. Doris, who are these men? Friends of mine. I'll introduce you in a minute, Geoffrey. We're in the middle of a match at the moment. Your turn, Mr. Holmes. The revolver, please? Here you are. Thank you. You, uh, you're sure you know how to handle a revolver? Oh, quite sure, thanks. Then why are you pointing it at me? Because I want you to raise your hands above your head. You too, whatever your name is. Doris, who are these men? Put up your hands. I shan't hesitate to shoot, I assure you. Come on, that's it. What in heaven's name do you think you're up to? Finding out what became of the real Mr. Quilter... Search the man, Watson. Right, you are, Holmes. Here you are. Yes, uh, go to the house, will you, and search it. Uh, yes, but of course. Hello, this man had a revolver on his hip. Keep him covered with it. Here, <clears throat> stand still, you. Now, sir, who are you? From your resemblance to the man in the wheelchair that we saw earlier, I should say that you're a member of the same family. We're both relatives of Mr. Quilter. That's right. My name's Davis. I'm from the Australian branch of the family. Relatives. Yes, and doubtless you stood to inherit his estate in the event of Quilter's death. You moved in on this defenseless old man, terrorized him, lived off him, and finally found it necessary to destroy him. You're talking absolute rubbish. You're showing the truth, and you know it. I can tell by your expressions. Move back into the house, both of you. Come on. And keep your hands raised. All right, that's it. Come on. Lead the way into the study. The man posing as Mr. Coulter is still there. We heard him call out as we came in. Yes, we might as well confront the three of them together. Yes, he's still seated in the chair. He seems to be asleep. Leah! Did you find anything? Not a trace of the missing men, Monsieur Holmes. Davis, what did you do with Mr. Quilter? I didn't do anything with him. Of course not. He's sitting there in that chair. Well, it's no good lying to us. We know that that man's an imposter. <sighs> this is a fantastic situation. Nobody has left this house since the telegram arrived, and nobody has come to it, and yet Mr. Quilter has vanished. <laughs> Good Lord, how can he sleep through all this talk? You'd think he'd been drugged. The Pia! We are idiots! You are unquestionably the most promising detective in France, and some people have been kind enough to grant me a similar status in England, and yet my old friend Watson has just solved the case. Oh, well, was nothing. was just uh, too happy to... Uh, what? Solved it? Well, how? Listen to the breathing of that man in the chair. What? He's been drugged. There sits the real Mr. Quilter. The persecuted victim who sent a cipher message for help. The man we spoke to earlier. Was you, Mr. Davies, impersonating Quilter. After you'd received us, you took off your disguise, adopted an Australian accent, and then hid your drug victim by placing him in his own wheelchair, knowing that would be the last place we'd look for him. Mm, and they would have kept him here until we had gone and then murdered him. What a devilish plot. Well, 
What have you got to say for yourselves? It was Jeffrey's idea, not mine. I didn't have anything to do with it. That's a dirty lie. You were in this as much as I am. Oh, this is splendid, simply splendid. Please continue the argument. It'll make interesting evidence in court. You can't take us into court. Of course you can't. What's the charge? Quilter's still alive, isn't he? When Mr. Quilter revives under Dr. Watson's ministrations, you will be charged, I have no doubt, with attempted murder, abduction, sequestration, duress, and probably several other counts. Monsieur Villard, if you will find us a cab, we'll take these miscreants to Scotland Yard. Our work is done. <laughs> Well, Doctor, that was a fine story. I re... What are you fidgeting for? Fidgeting? Me? Well, I'm expecting a guest. I thought I heard him just now at uh, the, the, the front door. A guest? <laughs> now, you're being as mysterious as Mr. Holmes. Oh, not quite. You see, I... Ah, come in. Dr. Watson, how are you, you old rascal? <laughs> Gregory, my boy. It's great to see you again. Mr. Bartell, meet my friend, Mr. Gregory Hood. Not... The Gregory Hood. Mr. Bartell, I like the way you say that. <laughs> yes, Mr. Bartell, this is the Gregory Hood. Mr. Bartell, if you listen to Dr. Watson, he'll lead you to believe I'm much more important than I am. I'm quite a simple person, really. I'm kind to dogs, just love little children, and always help old ladies cross the street. I also know how to make a fire by rubbing two sticks together. <laughs> yes, and unlike my old friend Holmes, you pretend to know very little about criminals and crime... And yet you're one of America's outstanding criminologists. So I've heard. A hobby, Mr. Bartell, a hobby. My real business is importing. Headquarters, San Francisco. Uh, need any old masters? Perhaps I can sell you a nice piece of jade, or uh, would you rather have a bit of old Balinese sculpture? <laughs> now, wait a minute. This is all a little too fast for me. <laughs> you learned that Gregory is a little too fast for everybody. Uh, but, Mr. Bartell, I'm sure you'll get to know Mr. Hood a good deal better. You see, as I've told you, I've always wanted to take a trip back to England... And now I have a chance to do so. But, Doctor, uh, won't I see you again? What about our story? Oh, I shall be back in the fall. But meanwhile, I've asked Mr. Gregory Hood to get together with you at this time every week and tell you some of his experiences. Which, of course, makes me feel very important. Mr. Hood, as you know, has been involved in many famous cases dealing in crime. His importing business and his hobby criminology are a strange combination. I learned that he keeps a diary of these cases. And it's a fascinating book. The case book of Gregory Hood. The case book of Gregory Hood. Sounds intriguing. Intriguing? Huh. It certainly is. Thank you. Well, then I can tell all our friends, be sure to listen next week at the same time and every Monday night through the summer to The Case Book of Gregory Hood. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Sign of Four. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California... Invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petrie family. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.